Welcome to the Redesigning Wellness Podcast. As wellness professionals, most of us are supporting employees and living healthier lives. When and why people change their behaviors has always been fascinating to me. I always wonder why some people change when others stay stuck. Today's guest, Umar Hamid, helps people get unstuck in something they want to accomplish. He's an expert in changing individual behavior and improving team dynamics. He uses techniques and tools from the world of applied neuroscience and NLP to make individuals and organizations more successful. Umar works with leaders, salespeople, and teams that want to become exceptional. Umar says every behavior and team dynamic has a belief that drives it. You can't create change unless you address the underlying belief. He's a keynote speaker, has 400 plus videos on YouTube, and is author of three books, including Unleash Your Crazy Sexy Brain. In my interview with Umar, he explains neurolinguistics programming and how it can change behavior quickly, consistently, and permanently, how it can keep people from reverting to their old behavior, and ways we as wellness professionals can incorporate some of the concepts and turn them into practice. Before we dive into the interview, I want to remind you that last week I launched the Redesigning Wellness Community, which is a closed Facebook group, and it is for wellness professionals to you know, just kind of build a sense of community where we can post the challenges that we're facing, the successes, and really learn from one another. In fact, um, one of the things that most people want to get out of it is networking. How do you network with people across the country and across the world, but also in your own local area? All you have to do is go to Facebook when you click on groups and you can search Redesigning Wellness Community, ask to join, and I will let you in. Um, I hope to see you there, and let's go ahead and dive into my interview with Umar Hamid. As always, thanks for listening to the Redesigning Wellness Podcast. Hello and welcome to Redesigning Wellness, your go-to podcast for making the most of your corporate health strategies. Your host is Jen Arnold, corporate wellness consultant. With over a decade of experience in promoting worksite health, she'll help boost your wellness program to one your employees are sure to enjoy. And now, here's Jen. Umar, welcome to the Redesigning Wellness Podcast. I'm so glad to have you on. Thanks so much for inviting me. I'm really excited to be here. And I always like to call out the people who connect me with some of my guests. And uh, Rachel Druckenmiller connected us. So thank you, Rachel. Thank you, Rachel. She's an awesome lady. She is, definitely. So Umar, you specialize in changing human behavior quickly, consistently, and permanently. And it's something I saw on your website called mind training. So that's a heavy question to start out with, but go ahead and set the tone. So let me actually take a step back. If I was, you know, telling someone a story like this, uh, you have a, a soldier in the battlefield, many horrible things happen, but this one particular thing happens and a moment before it, they were okay. And just seeing this one scene in that moment destroys their world. Post-traumatic stress disorder, all those other horrible things didn't do it, but this one little thing that could have been a near miss and not even somebody getting injured, but Everyone that I tell that story to goes, oh, my God, I know exactly what you're talking about. But what they don't see on the underside of it is that a human being went from one state to another state in a moment. But what if instead of going from being okay to being not okay in a moment, that we could actually use it to go from being not okay to okay, that change happens in a moment. Another way of putting it is someone can go, let's say, a fear of public speaking that they won't do it no matter what. They go to a therapist. Six months later, one Thursday afternoon, the therapist says something that's so profound that the person has an epiphany and they can automatically start public speaking. It took six months to get there. I'm not interested in the six months, but I sure am interested when the therapist said that one thing a moment later, their world changed. What if we could bring that change to people? I call it the change point to them today. So no more going to the mountain and meditating for seven years, no seeing therapists for two years. Why don't we create the change now? Wouldn't that be more useful? Yeah. Isn't what, that awesome? <laughs> it, it would, Umar. But so would you say that those, you know, let's just six, seven years of therapy didn't do anything and it was just that one change point that, uh, that did it. It was just that minute. I think so. I mean, uh, sometimes... Uh, if I talk to someone that used to smoke and they say, uh, have you quit? Yes, I've quit seven times. Tell me about the last time. And they'll say, one morning I woke up 
And I looked on the side of the bed and I saw the ashtray there. And in that moment, I knew I'd never touch another cigarette again. All the other times were attempts, but they just had a sense of knowing. And that moment that it was a permanent change. And so we all experienced that change. And sometimes, you know, through, you know, seven years of trying to do whatever and we get the epiphany ourselves or with professional help, or sometimes people have to go down the path of cancer where they get to the door of death death's door. And in that moment, they have this epiphany that says, you know what? This life that I had isn't the life that I want. I want this life. And it's interesting how we use language because we don't use language accidentally. It's very purposefully. What we chose to call that is remission, that they had some kind of mission and then something changed and they had a remission, a new mission. And I'm not sure whether the healing process created the, the new path to life or they had this epiphany that said, I want my life to be about X, and that created the healing. But it happened so darn close, I choose to believe that when we figure out that we need to change, change happens, and it changes everything around us. So do you help people create that epiphany, or you know, do you kind of uncover some underlying beliefs that they have? How, like, how, how do you work? I'll tell you a couple of stories, because they're the best ways to uh, kind of share what I do. When I first started doing this in 2003, all I did was just see hundreds upon hundreds of people that were stuck that would come in and say, this is going on. So recently, uh, I did a presentation for a company. It was a half-day workshop. And one of the participants reached out and said, you know, I really want to come see you. And so she comes in and she says, you know, everything went wrong. When my dad died four years ago, everything that could have gone wrong went wrong. And I had a lot of anxiety before he died, you know, personally. But after that happened, you know, in every area of my life, I feel threatened. My career is in the best place right now, but I'm certain that things are going to go wrong. And as she's telling me the story, obviously that moment with her dad's passing, and she had said, hey, I went on a, on a cruise for a month. And the change in him in that month, he went from being looking okay to looking like he was on death's door. And he died a month after that. And I said, okay, it sounds like, you know, something happened there. So I also happened to be a really good hypnotist. And I hypnotized her and had her visit a cottage with two chairs. And she sat in one chair. And I said, all you need to do is ask, say your dad's name, and he's going to be there when he appears. Just lift up your finger so I know. And she lifts up her finger. And then she got a chance to have that closure with him that she never had in life. And when she came out of that process, I had her tell her dad how much she loved him and missed him. He got to respond when that was over. She lifted up a finger. She got to tell him about his alcoholism, his abuse, his abandonment of her and her mother. They had a discussion around that. Then it was her dad's turn to tell her how much he loved her. She got to respond. Then if he was disappointed in her, she got that closure. At the end of that session, I didn't hear any of the conversations. It's happening inside her head. Then I finally go, at the count of three, I want you to come back. One, two. She comes back and she goes, I've discussed this with my therapist many, many times over the years. And for the first time, I feel like something has changed inside here. And I've got closure on it, and I'm getting my life back. And that was just the first step in the path. But that ability, did she really meet her dad? I have no idea. But did she get the closure she needed? Yeah. And so that's what we do. Is Sometimes people come in and say, you know, I wish I could. When I ask my clients and say, you know, this will be $4,000, uh, and the customer pushes back, and it's like, okay, $3,000. I wish I wouldn't cave in on price or I've got these issues around money. It's like, well, tell me about a particular time you went into a situation, maybe that time where your voice cracked when you said the amount, go back there in your mind's eye, go, okay, see that customer that you're having a conversation with. They go, okay, I'm doing it. Hear the conversation. When you see something and hear something, you get to re-experience what you were feeling. What are you feeling? And they'll go, felt a tightness in my throat over here. There's a tool from uh, neurolinguistics. You can link that feeling to the unconscious mind that records everything. And for her, it went back to a time where she was going out to a restaurant with her parents. And she was like maybe seven or eight. And her dad looked at her and said, don't order a steak. Can't afford it. And in that moment, it created a relationship around money, a belief around money that controlled the rest of her life. And then just using this tool, she doesn't know where it comes from. It's like she's just got this uncomfortable feeling when she's talking about money. We link that feeling to the unconscious mind. It goes to a pivotal event. We take care of it. And that's how quickly it happens. So the person doesn't have to remember it, but they've recorded it. We'll help them access it. Interesting. Once See, again, isn't this cool? Yeah. <laughs> just that sense that human beings can change. It's not that well, what I do is so special, 
but it's that we have this capacity as human beings to create that change. And everybody in society, in education, in spirituality says, you know, hey, change is hard, change is difficult. It's going to happen, but you have to stick with it. And I'm here to tell you with, with neuroscience and neurolinguistics, we have the ability now to get you to the change point right now. But please go on. I don't want to get carried away, but I am excited <laughs> about this stuff. It's a watershed moment for humanity, right? If we get the change we want, we'd build the lives that we want. So you really work, because let me paraphrase what, what I think I heard you say. So you're <laughs> saying that you work with people to really get to their underlying belief. So what, what is it that's standing in their way of the change they want to make and really get down to, okay, what's behind that? So is there yes. always something behind the change? The people who are resistant to change, is there always something that's stopping them Like that goes way back to childhood or goes back to something like their father's death? Or can it be a little bit more minor? It could be minor and it could be. So let me uh, give you kind of the background, how human beings work. And then I'll answer that question specifically. So at the heart of who we are as human beings is where we hold our beliefs. And we have beliefs about parenting, about love, about marriage, about coffee, about business, about money, anything in our awareness that's important to us, we have a belief in our unconscious that controls it. The only issue is, is that most of our beliefs uh, happen by the time we're seven years of age. So it doesn't have to be a traumatic event. It just could be that, let's say dad's coming home from work and on the way home, there's a cop that's hiding behind a bush, gives him a big bat ticket. Dad comes into the house and goes, He's angry and he tells his wife, you know, those damn cops are out to get you. And Sally in the other room, who's six, goes, well, you can't trust cops. And it becomes a belief that you can't trust cops. And then it's not a real belief, right? She just heard it from her dad. It's important. It goes in. So then she has to validate it. But the only problem is she's looking from that prism at the entire world out there. So if she ever hears of a story doing something, a cop doing something wrong, it strengthens that belief. And it gets stronger and stronger because she's collecting data to validate it. And she doesn't realize she's doing it. So it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. You could have someone that, you know, comes, uh, they're in uh, the park and they're doing stuff and somebody's selling a piece of artwork and they go, you know, I maybe shouldn't buy it. It's too expensive. And the wife says to the, the husband, honey, you deserve it. And in that moment, a child could get a belief around money that, hey, hey there's always enough money that you deserve it. And then that also becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. So we get these beliefs that define who we are. And most of our beliefs are amazing and beautiful and allow us to build amazing lives. We have families and success and all that kind of stuff. From those beliefs, we create a model of the world, how we think the world works. And you have friends that you suggest, you know, you could do this, or you have clients that you suggest you could do this. But in their model of the world, what you're saying, even though they're paying you for your advice, that simply does not exist. It's not possible. And they'll might even go, okay, but in their mind, that is not a possibility. Because our model of the world dictates our behaviors, and they'll try and do what you tell them, but they won't do it in a way that'll lead to success. They'll do it in a way that, uh, you know, will let them flounder. And once in a while, they end up being successful, and they'll go, I don't believe it, that it happened. And you know why they say that? Because they literally don't believe it. So our model of the world gives us our behaviors, and that always gives us our results. So in life, as you go in romance or business or parenting or whatever, you go to do stuff that you want to do, and you do it effortlessly. But there's certain things that you and I go to do and an uncomfortable feeling comes up or we pull our punches or I had the idea here, but I didn't want to share it because I didn't want people to think ill of me. In those things that you want to do and you're not doing it, that's where we look for an underlying belief that might be causing that issue. And so one of the places people get stuck is a limiting belief. There's another two ways people get stuck. Would you like to hear about those? Of course I would. Yes. So a second place that people get stuck, and you might see this with your clients, is that uh, you'll get someone that will tell you, Jennifer, I know I can do this. And they'll tell you why it's important to them and why it's, they're going to have it happen, no doubt. And as they're talking, they use a strong voice and they use strong gestures. And they're very, very Italian when they say this. And I, and I look at that. And then sometimes the other hand will come up. But you know, I really don't have the right education for it. And that might get in the way, so I'm not sure. But it's going to happen. Mark my word. As soon as I, and then they'll go back to this side, why it won't happen. When I see that, so it was strong gestures on one side and strong voice coupled with it. And on the other side, weak gestures and a weak voice. And what that shows me is there's an internal conflict. One part of their psyche knows it's going to happen. And the other side saying, who the hell do you think you're kidding? If you were taller, sexier, shorter, more educated, whatever, it would happen. When I see that, that's an internal conflict. 
And that's something neurolinguistics is really great at identifying and resolving. And a lot of times you'll get a leader of a company and you'll hear this from a lot of people saying, you know, our boss finally fired this one person that worked for us or killed a project that was, you know, needed killing. And they'll go up to that CEO and say, oh, thanks so much for doing that. But, you know, you could have done it a year ago. And the reason the CEO didn't is not that they didn't know it was a bad idea because one part of them knew it was a dumb idea and it needed to be killed or that person needed to be fired. But another part of them needs to be liked. And had they done that thing, you know, people would have been disappointed in the project or that person would think ill of them. So the inner conflict of knowing what to do and the need to be liked are at odds with each other. And we can identify that and heal it within an hour. And when we do that, they make better decisions, faster decisions. So that's the second way place people get stuck. And the third place people get stuck, something called hot wiring, where there's some kind of trigger that starts a process. And it could be that someone's going, you know, I am great at dealing with companies that are, you know, $20 million and under, and I am awesome and amazing. I add a ton of value. And my dream is to land a large account. And they've been trying for six months and they finally get a meeting with the division of a major bank. And they're so excited and they know exactly what to say. They go into the lobby of that company, and as soon as they go in there, look at the opulence, starts to trigger that all of a sudden this inner voice comes up. I'm not sure if you have an inner voice that says, who are you kidding? They're more sophisticated. They'll want to deal with a larger company. Or if you had you know, a Harvard education, and we sabotage ourselves, and when we go to do the presentation, we do it. The only time in the last six months we've ever done a bad presentation is that one, is because self-doubt came in, because there was a trigger that triggered that inner sabotage. So three places we get stuck. One is a limiting belief that gets in the way. Two is in a conflict where we know we can do it, but another part says, who are you kidding? The third place is a hot wired response. And we have the tools now to be able to teach people how to break through in any one of those areas so they can figure out what they want to do with life and actually go out wholeheartedly knowing with certainty that if they get stuck, there's ways to get unstuck very quickly. So a few comments there. One was, uh, you know, I have two young kids, so it really scares the hell out of me to think about what what I'm giving them as limiting beliefs. So I'm, I'm Just, very conscious of that. Go ahead. By the way, if you do grow up, it's more clients for me. So thank you so much. For <laughs> uh, What's yeah. the other thing? I will try to not screw up my kids. Um, so do you find that when working with CEOs or really anyone of the, the you know, kind of higher on the corporate ladder, any consistent limiting beliefs or internal conflict, because you mentioned wanting to be liked. And I imagine that is most people want to be liked regardless if they say they don't or not. So that's a human need. So sometimes here's one of the things that I find more common than you would think. One is sometimes people go sooner or later, people are going to figure out I'm a fraud. Imposter syndrome. And if you, yeah. And if you look at their accomplishments, you would go, oh my God, are you kidding me? You've done all these amazing, fantastic things, and you have that inside your head. And sometimes that imposter syndrome gets in the way, and sometimes that imposter syndrome is the very thing that's driven them to achieve amazing results. So sometimes when you have that negative thing, it doesn't necessarily mean it's all bad. Sometimes it's good. So here's one of the truths that I've learned. Every single behavior that you do, that I do, every single belief that you have, that I have, no matter how noble and fantastic or how tragic and, and flawed, every single one of those behaviors and belief has a positive intention for you and for all. I. So you could have somebody that I had this girl come in once who was uh, cutting herself and uh, everyone would go, oh, my God, that's terrible. And sweetheart, you're a beautiful person and your mother loves you and you shouldn't be doing that. And it's like, oh, my God, what total therapeutic bullshit. That's true to a point. But is that really going to change that behavior? It isn't. So if you look for the underlying cause, I wonder why you're doing that. And one of the ways to do that is tell me about a particular time you went to harm yourself. What was going on? What were you feeling? And then you use that feeling to figure out what's really causing it. And for this young lady, it was something happened in an earlier age, probably never knew what, didn't care, that she built up a shield around her heart, that nothing was going to penetrate and hurt her. Only problem was the shield was keeping her mom's love from coming in. And when she cut herself and her mom discovered it, her mom would freak out and the emotions would go through the roof. Lots of screaming and yelling and stuff. But that intensity of emotion from a mother was the only thing that would go through that shield. And so once we figured out there was a shield there, then we go in and remove the shield. But so sometimes those negative things that are out there, they're there to protect us. They harm us in a lot of ways, but we look for what's the positive intention. So all I'm interested in is you could be a CEO of an aeronautical company. What do I know about aeronautics? Zippo. 
Uh, but tell me where you want to do something and you're not doing it. And let's figure out what's getting in the way. And from that, it always comes down to being a human event. It's either self-doubt or uncertainty or a belief about uh, I'm only worth this much. How could I possibly go for this other goal? So intellectually, they're going for it and they're bleeding for it. And they're sweating for it. But internally, in their heart of hearts, it's like you don't deserve. We figure out, oh, if you're not doing it, let's figure out what's blocking. And uh, what, what lets me do the work that I do is how many people out there that have a book an idea, or just have a level of happiness they want to achieve that they're not achieving because of some artificial construct that's been created that's stopping them from doing it. And if we could do that, it would make the world a better place. Because if you are happier as a human being, and excuse my language here, it's really hard to be a, a jerk. The word I was going to say was asshole, but I don't want to say that on a podcast. <laughs> we already said it, so, you know, which good, go ahead. Yes. <laughs> so, because if I am happy in what I'm doing, and I'm feeling fulfilled, then I'm more predisposed to help people find that for themselves too. And it's when we have people that are stuck, that aren't achieving what they want to achieve, that sometimes use other tactics to get what they want. So if we can help one person get a breakthrough, they become that lighthouse for other people going, wow, change is possible. And sometimes that's all they need is just seeing that happen and go, well, why am I holding on to this, you know, negative belief around my parents. I can just let that go. And in that instant, they got their change. Unfortunately, not a billable event for me, but isn't that amazing? Like sometimes just seeing that someone just decides that I don't need to do that anymore. Then they become that beacon of light for other people. Yeah, I think it really is fascinating. So one of the things that you mentioned was changing behavior permanently. And then that's something that as you know, wellness professionals struggle with. And we always talk about with like, let's just say weight loss, people you tend to go on a diet, they lose weight and gain it back. So what are your, I guess, tricks or, you know, tips for permanently changing human behavior? So I'll tell you a story and then I'll kind of link it together if that's okay. Sure. So I had this business coaching client come in and we're doing businessy stuff. And then one of the side things is like, you know, uh, wait, I want to lose weight. And what do I know about weight loss? Not a lot other than do more exercise and don't eat as much as you did in the past is my strategy. But it's okay, let's take a look at the weight loss and tell me about a time where you, you know, wanted to lose weight and you were gaining it. And then we get that feeling in that body sensation, use neurolinguistics to go track it back. And this is what had happened for her about 10 or 15 years earlier. And she's, a, you know, in her late 50s, early 60s, her husband had some medical issue that was pretty serious. And they had to go to Boston for a special treatment and the doctor had told her, you know, don't be shocked when your husband loses a lot of weight because that's going to happen in this procedure. And she said, internally, I said, not on my watch. And I made sure he had the right food and he ate. And uh, he actually lost maybe five pounds in the thing and not the 30 that they expected. But when he I was feeding him and myself and somehow she linked in her head at an unconscious level. If I stop eating, he's going to die. And so that was the belief that got created, you know, in her 40s. So underneath, this is how we create change. Underneath every single belief that you have, uh, you remember I said there was a positive intention. Mm -hmm. Sometimes that positive intention could have been there for 15 years or 50 years, and there was a that belief. And when we looked at, you know, validation for it, and uh, for this woman, her belief that you know if I stop eating, he's going to die. The positive intention for that belief was to keep my husband alive, keep love alive. And so if we get a new belief that says, okay, stop eating like a, like a beast, it's in ether and it has no structure. But if we got another belief that said, you know, if you eat more healthily, you and your husband will have a longer relationship and the love will stay alive longer. It taps into that initial positive intention. And what the human mind will do is say, wait a minute, this belief about eating to keep him alive is causing all kinds of health issues, lots of negatives. This new belief about eating healthier will allow me to have love with him longer. And the brain automatically dumps the first belief and it adopts the second belief. But instead of an ether, it links it to that 15 years of positive intention. So that's the structure that makes it permanent. And that's the trick is that, you know, in therapy, sometimes we go and it's like, you know, I'm not lovable and I'm in this relationship and it's going OK, but it will never get better. And the therapist says, well, let's get rid of that. We're going to get rid of that thought because that's really bad. 
And what they don't realize is underneath that, there was a positive intention that's got 30 years of structure that if you throw that away, you're throwing all of it away and you're hoping this new belief that'll be an ether will catch on. So I always look at the negative belief. What's the positive intention and find another belief that gives you the behaviors you want, but hold on to that positive intention. Then you just let the human mind do the rest of the work and they'll dump the old belief, embrace the new belief, but attach it to the positive intention. So how do you keep that new belief? I'm imagining you don't say it once and then you're golden. Like, do you have to reinforce it? Do you have to like make a mantra out of it each day? No, like- you don't. And uh, so let me give you an example. And it sounds like, you know, come on, that can't be right. So I'm going to give you more of a salesy uh, example. Okay. I was working with this guy who's a great salesperson, comes in and says, you know, there's this one area where I struggle and the area that I struggle is asking for referrals. You know, I can ask for the deal and I don't cave in on price, but asking for a referral, something about that makes me feel uncomfortable. And what we figure out is that when somewhere in his head, he got the notion that asking real men don't ask for help and it violates that belief, asking for referrals. So we changed that belief and I got a call a couple of weeks later saying, you know, I'm not sure what you did, but I'm comfortably asking for referrals. And the reason it's more of a permanent change is because we linked it to the positive intention. Now, sometimes we need to give booster shots, but because they're getting better results right away and there, there isn't the internal conflict, because what happens sometimes is, so let's say we go to someone, you know, you can ask for referrals. People want to give them. They go, okay, I'll try it. Uh, you know, Jennifer, would you like to give, uh, recommend me to someone? And you give me something. What's happening is there's a part of me, if you heard my voice is kind of tentative, that still has that notion that that's not the right thing to do. So I'm doing it hesitantly, tentatively. And guess what? That negative side that has a structure of 15 years is stronger than this new belief. And it's going to sabotage what I'm doing. And very quickly, within a a day, a week, a month, I'm going to go back to the old behavior. But when you attach it to the old positive intention, the old belief has nothing to cling on to because that's been taken over by the new belief. So the change tends to be pretty radical and pretty permanent. And then we can coach them around it to make sure it sticks. But you'll be surprised. So let me give you uh, an example that might make more sense. Okay. That, do you remember that old movie, Gone with the Wind? Yes. There's this one scene from it where uh, Scarlett O'Hara, uh, the actress, uh, do you remember who she played? Uh, who, what do you mean who she played? Like what her role was? Was it Scarlett was the name of the woman? No, that was the, her character. Yeah. So Scarlett, she's, there's this one scene where, you know, her uh, state is in ruins and she says something like, as God as my witness, I will never go hungry again. Mm-hmm. And there was like power there. And that would be a representation of somebody just getting a belief shift that like before she was going hungry and she was you know, trying to make things better. And but at this one moment in time, it was like, a, that's it. I'll never go hungry again as God is my witness. And we go through that as human beings ourselves. We get to this stage and we decide that, you know, I'm never going to put myself down again. And it isn't a wish. It's that internal kind of switch goes off. That is something that's a permanent change. And like I said, sometimes people get that, at, you know, they almost get into a car wreck and all of a sudden they reexamine their life and it just sends them on a different path. It's not, I'll try this. It's like a certainty. Using belief change like this gives you that certainty. Well, I was really glad that you used that one scene from Gone with the Wind because that's honestly the only thing I remember from the movie. So. Me too. <laughs> other than Scarlet, my dear, I don't give a damn. That's the only other one. There you go. That's two. So I'm glad you came up with that reference because I saw it but a long, long time ago. That, that all that all makes sense. Um, but define for me the term neuro linguistics because you've used that term a few times and it was new to me before you know we connected. So do you mind just? And I know you've kind of defined it throughout this this chat. But sure. Tell us what it is. So the branch of science is called neuro linguistic programming, and neuro, of course, refers to the brain. Uh, language refers to not only the language of the brain, but how we use language to influence what the brain does. And programming sounds kind of like it's a, you know, a loaded phrase, but what it really means is, so when you wake up in the morning, you go through a process, you know, you open your eyes, you might yawn, you might think about the day, you get out of bed. Generally, you're going to repeat that exact same thing unless there's a fire drill going on every single day for your life, because that's your process for waking up. That's like a program that you've created for yourself. And so we have a ton of programs. You have a program that gets you to choose the outfit you're about to wear that day or for an event. So if you had to really think about it and, you know, 
figure it through each time, you would you wouldn't exist anymore. You'd be spending time thinking all the time. So you create these subroutines called choosing or uh, getting up in the morning, and it just becomes something you have to think about. You just do. So neuro, the brain, linguistics, language, and then the programs that govern our life on how we function at work, uh, in romance, and with our kids, and spiritually, neuro-linguistic programming. Thank you for that very good, concise definition of it. How can a wellness professional use some of these concepts that we've talked about to help employees change their behaviors? There's some wellness professionals that work individually, one-on-one with employees, and then some, you know, typically it's like a whole group of employees. So it's more of a team approach or group programming. So how can we apply some of these concepts? So a couple of ways. One is helping ourselves become braver, stronger, faster, more loving, more loved. So we get our own breakthroughs and become that beacon of light for folks. So number one, it takes our our game up to a higher level because uh, we just operate at a higher level and we make a bigger impact. So I think the first place to start is as individuals. The second thing is, you know, once we learn those techniques of helping people get breakthroughs, it allows us because uh, let me ask you a question, Jennifer, Mm -hmm. this, you know, losing weight and being healthier, how much of that is mechanics, you know, exercising, eating differently. And how much of that is mindset, would you say percentage wise? Oh, I'd say mindset, um, just beliefs, (laughs) mindset's the majority of it. So, uh, and the same thing is true for, you know, leadership or well-being in our careers mindset is a large part and i'm going to minimize it and let's say it is 40 percent mindset if we don't have that right the other stuff uh, is destined to fail or it'll succeed only for a short time and people will revert back so as wellness professionals when we learn these techniques uh it allows us to work on that mindset piece with our clients and once we work with that mindset piece it makes the other stuff a lot easier to do. And so individually, we can do that. And in group settings, one of the things we can do is we can incorporate some of these techniques, and there's some more advanced NLP techniques that are designed in uh, to do group work. Here's an example of one. Have you ever noticed when someone's teaching up front and you got, let's say, 100 people in the room, that there's a certain percentage, maybe one or two or three people, that absorb things very, very quickly, and they're already three steps ahead of the instructor, and they might be getting bored a little bit. Mm -hmm. And then you have a majority of people that are with the instructor and just learning as they go, and they're, you know, having a good time doing it. And there's a certain percentage, I'm going to take a sip of water, there's a certain percentage of people that get lost. And because they get lost and they didn't get the previous point, they can't really pay attention to the next point. And so the instructor's like, what do I do? Do I, I can see with their faces and their body language, there's a group of people that are lost. Now I can stop and backtrack, but it's going to take the people that were on board with me. Uh, it's going to make them bored because all of a sudden, they're like, well, why are we repeating this? And the people that were already bored because they're three steps ahead of me, are, I'm really going to lose them. So one of the things you can do is as you're presenting in the first half hour is you can tell a story about someone being really confused. And if I tell a story really well about being confused, and if I really feel that confusion as I'm telling the story, which all great storytellers do is they feel that uh, emotion authentically, that's what separates great actors from people that are pretending. Makes sense, right? Mm -hmm. So hold that thought. I'm going to go to a totally different thought and come back to this. Have you ever had the experience of hearing a song on the radio where you get transported back to junior high, maybe being at the beach, and a significant other or your significant other has to joshua, you know, touch you on the shoulder to bring you back. And it's not like I remember that, you know, time at the beach. It's like a reliving. Oh, my God, I was back at the beach. That song took me there. Have you had one of those experiences? Yeah, I think so. Well, we have a smell that takes us back to our grandmother's kitchen. So it's a human ability of linking some kind of stimulus to a past emotional event. Mm-hmm. So as I tell that story on stage about being confused, I can link that emotion that the audience is feeling because I'm feeling it and they're into the story, link it to a spot on the floor. So anytime I step into that spot, people would get confused. But on the very next uh, spot next to it that I know specifically where it is, I tell the story. I continue that story on of coming across this little map of the shopping mall. And you know what? It clearly showed me where the Apple store was and I was just so close and I knew exactly how to get there. And that relief that I felt was totally amazing. And I understood where I was going. And I tell that part of the story. And and I'm really feeling that, you know, wow, I've got everything under control. 
I can link that feeling to that spot on the floor. And so I've got two anchors on the floor, one of confusion, and then just stepping next door and getting that epiphany. What I've done is I've created a program on the floor of my stage. So as soon as I step into that spot that has confusion, people for a minute will get confused because they feel that emotion, just like the song on the radio made you feel that emotion around you know, that time you were at the beach. And if, people, if I'm losing people, I'll step into that confusion state for a moment. I'll just sidestep into the getting the epiphany and clarity. And you'll see those 10% of people that were confused originally. All of a sudden, it's like they get snap out of their haze and they feel like they're not lost anymore. Isn't that amazing that I could have that level of mastery over the audience in the room that I could actually pre-program an emotional response on the stage on day one of the four-day presentation. And anytime people are getting lost, I can trigger that program within them. Hmm. That's why using NLP for good is like the, the force. Only use it for good. Do not go <laughs> to the dark side. <laughs> I was just teasing. I was saying my young Padawan on Star Wars reference. Oh, yes. My, my son's really into Star Wars. So do you do that whenever you teach workshops or you present that you start out with a story and you actually, you know, can you know, walk through the, what you just explained to them to make sure that people, I, you can transfer them? I do that. And I do it as, uh, so here's where I see my job as a human being. It's my job as a human being to connect with people where they're at. So if I do something like that on stage, it is with the best intentions of the people that I'm teaching, that I have to come to their level and teach them in their model of the world. And by doing so, I expand their model of the world. So a lot of these techniques that I use are designed to honor the person that I'm teaching, whether it's an individual or it's a group of people. Very interesting. I'm just uh, sitting here taking it all in. Uh, Tell us a little bit more about how people can contact you. I'll, of course, link up all your social info in, in the show notes. But, you know, just talk a little bit about what you do and how people can contact you. So there's probably uh, three ways to play with me. And I really like that phraseology play because we do our best work when we're in play mode. So one way would just you know, go to the website or give me a phone call. And what that'll do is uh, get a direct conversation. We'll just chat about where they are, where they want to go. And so I help people get their individual breakthroughs. So they come in, I'm stuck, help me get unstuck. Or Umar, coach with me. And my coaching sessions tend to be, let's do an intensive month or two and get you to be Jennifer 2.0, that you're fearless, bold, that you know exactly who you are, what you stand for, what's the vision that's worthy of you to fulfill. And uh, so just very rapid stuff, short-lived relationships. And then there's just workshops and keynote presentations. And there's also an online component. And one of the things that uh, I'd recommend your listeners go to, and you'll put it in the show notes, is called Mind Training for Salespeople and Leaders. And there's going to be some of the NLP techniques that are in that training that's free that they can actually go and start playing with it and get to experience it themselves. Then after that, they can come to a workshop and learn NLP or get some online training on the NLP side of stuff. Yeah, and I'll just make a comment. Thanks for all that. Um, I'll just make a comment too, because when I was leading a team of wellness professionals, we transitioned a little bit to selling. And that was a hard um, transition for a lot of people, including myself, because I think as wellness professionals, we tend to shy away from the selling aspect of any uh, of anything, um, because we yes. like to just consider it helping people, right? That's what, what we tend to do. So I know that there are probably some limiting beliefs among wellness professionals in the, the selling world, I guess. Absolutely. It's just hotwired in our society. We have, you know, there's a uh... A couple of areas where we have a lot of negative baggage. One is around money. Like you can lend a lawnmower to a friend, and when you need it back at the end, return it. You go, "Hey, Jennifer, where's my lawnmower?" Would say, you know, effortlessly without hesitation. But some people, if they lent you a hundred dollars, they'd go, oh, "I don't want to ask her for the money. She might think that you know I need money, and all that kind of BS comes up." So we have beliefs around money that limit our success in life, and money is an important element of life because you know this is how we look after our kids and don't do all that stuff so we have a lot of negative baggage around money we have a lot of baggage around sales asking people for money Mm -hmm. and then the third place we have a lot of baggage around is love and being loved because uh, i could see this amazing woman across the you know the bar that i think is you know 
person I'd like to get to know more as you know friends, I could go up and say, hey, Jennifer, how are you? My name's Umar. I just thought we should say hello. And I'll come across in a way that'll be light and inviting and foolishly, you would say, hi, Umar, how are you? But if I had a sexual component to it, oh my God, I'd like to sleep with this woman and I want her to be my girlfriend or whatever. And then all of a sudden it changes that dynamic totally. And if I went over, hi, Jennifer, I'm Umar, or I'd have more, you know, be boasting about stuff. And it just changes that thing because uh, all of a sudden it's not about friendship. It's about love and sexuality. So they're the three places where we get stuck the most, money, selling, and love. And as being wellness professionals, I'm not sure how many of us have that need to be loved and to spread love, but a lot of us do. Money and self-worth gets in the way. And then, of course, selling, you know, I should be doing this for the greater good. Why am I charging that much? And if we make peace with all of those, we end up being that model for our clients. Because if we let go of our baggage, we become more authentic in the things that we want to teach. And that just allows our learning to go across more easily and people being more accepting. All right. Well, um, that bar example was a little strange to end on, but we'll go with it. It wasn't. It wasn't. <laughs> but you can, the reason I, I, I love that really is very it. much because people can relate to that. It's like, <laughs> oh my God, I was tongue tied. Uh, no, that was, that was, uh, they're all clear examples. Thank you for that. I just I ha- had to say that. Um, I think it's like, because it? I, I haven't been in a bar in forever. So, um, you know, maybe I need to. Out to see what's going on. Stay away. <laughs> I've been married like 26 years, and it's like, I can't even imagine. <laughs> no, I don't, I don't want to imagine right now. What's your sign? Exit. <laughs> well, Umar, thank you for walking us through this neuro linguistics programming. It's very it's fascinating to me. And thanks for your time, and I'll link up everything in the show notes. Thank you so much for inviting me, and it was a joy uh, chatting with you. If you'd like more information on resilience training for leaders or mindful eating workshops, visit redesigningwellness.com. Thank you so much for listening to the Redesigning Wellness podcast.